Hey, Fran. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome, Fran. Fran's one of the board members with the ATOA. This is ATOA Artist Talk on Art. I believe this is our 37th Monday virtual open studio. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, the president of the ATOA. This has been a, a pleasure to host and it's been our sort of response to COVID-19. Normally we are on the Lower West Side. We have been so for the last 46 years. Um, it's terrible what's going on, but somehow we have pivoted. We have come together. We have done many talks and we now are able to have people come. Uh, we had Bobby Van from Mexico uh, for the talk that Leah Pollard gave uh, last week, which was uh, quite an exciting talk on portraiture and we've had people from venice people from Ca venice italy we've had people from california from indiana um we will go back to our location at 12 west 12th street once it is safe but we don't see that happening very soon um but you know we hope it does and we will continue this format as well we are a 501 c3 we're a nonprofit. Um, everything we do here is free. You're all welcome. And we, you are what make this what it is. This is artists yeah. <laughs> working on art. We appreciate everybody's response. You, you yourself, if you feel this conversation yeah, going on so in your background. There's someone there or not, you still have to be. Um, okay. Just be aware that we do pick up your signs, your, what's going on in your background. So do mute yourself if necessary. Feel free at any time when we have presenters speaking to go ahead and ask a question. We do have a, uh, a chat room where you can type in questions, but as well, you're always welcome to just go ahead and ask a question, open up dialogue, and as well, make a statement. It doesn't have to be a question. We're a very positive group. I think we've grown that way. And it's nice to see so many regulars and new people. Um, you can contribute if you like. There's more than enough information on our website atoanyc.org. Um, and, you know, I, I want to thank you all. This has been, it's been a long run and a very good run, and I've enjoyed it greatly. A lot of you have sent emails saying the same thing. I think we've come together in many ways. And uh, feel free, if you ever want to put together a panel or organize something, just send me an idea. I am going to say yes, and we'll pick out a date and we'll make it happen. Um, and so, We'll, we'll move forward. I do want to acknowledge Roberta Bernardi is here, our most regular board member in attendance, who, as a result of this, is looking to take up, I think it is watercolor or acrylic, and she will be presenting one day. There's no question about it. She's laughing hysterically right now. You don't have <laughs> to see this on mute or unmute. You know what's going on over there. And yeah, that's what it's about. We inspire each other. We picked up ideas. We recommend artists. I do want to say thank you again to Leah Pollard. You did such a great job with that panel. It was really, that is a round of applause, claps and snaps. You know, we've already had 60 views on the YouTube channel of that presentation. We had a large group of about 42 people at one time. Uh, keep in mind, our YouTube channel is under Artist Talk on Art. You can see that the links are on our website, atoanyc.org. And I do want to mention on January 4th, we have a special presentation, Charlie Rubin, artist using photography in different ways. He's invited three other artists. So we'll have four artists presenting and with a very specific presentation from a group of artists that have not been at one of our talks before. And we also on the 18th, we have a fascinating performance artist from Scotland who did an amazing project, invited 100 performers, 60 of them participated, and we're in for a treat, something very different. So welcome, everybody. Um, we have the recording going. I think, uh, I think we'll do a quick start with Larry. Um, Larry Ahrens wanted to update us on one piece that he was working on that I think he mentioned was like Caravaggio. So I'll hand it over to Larry. This will be short. Larry did a longer presentation before, and then we'll I'll move on to uh, Dara Land. So welcome, Larry. Thank you very much, and hello to everybody, and of course, happy holidays in advance. Um, as Barry just said, um, he and I have had a couple of quick emails. Um, one of the things that I had shared with Barry and uh, many of you before was 
the speed in which I work. And uh, Barry and I had a conversation going back. He thought if I'd slow down a little bit, I could become Goya. I said to him, well, I don't think so, but uh, thank you for the compliment, which uh, unfortunately leads me into where I want to just quickly take everybody. Um, um, I had a, a very, very wonderful opportunity from a friend of mine who I train with in, in another discipline. I'm a martial artist. And he had shared a picture of his son with me. And um, I was very taken by it. And so I decided to do a painting of his son. And um, it was very much inspired by my feelings about Caravaggio, uh, about the depth of his light and his shadow. And of course, about the chiaroscuro, the uh, coloring and the darkness and the light. So I just thought I'd share that with everybody. Uh, this is Matteo. I don't know if anyone can, can see it. I'm trying not to get too much glare on oh, it. Yeah. It's good. And uh, so this is a, a painting that is very much in the flavor of uh, Caravaggio. And uh, I just wanted to share with everybody for everyone to see it. Uh, it is a, a painting that I started um, early on a Monday morning and kind of finished into uh, Tuesday. And uh, I have not put any uh, um, glazes over it or any uh, varnish yet. So I, I just wanted to share with those of you who have seen some of my earlier portrait work. And uh, just to say, this is what I, the most recent one I've done. Very nice, Larry, beautiful work. Thank you. Anybody have any questions, please let me know. I have to say that it probably, especially for uh, this purpose, probably looks especially right, good right. without the varnish. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to do that to protect it because um, he, um, he surprised me when I showed it to him and he said he wanted to purchase it for his son, for his son's apartment. And I said, well, I'm taken by that. So then I, nef I would never just give somebody a painting. I, I do need to seal it. So it uh, does have a bit of, um, you know, protection to it. But anyhow, so I just wanted to share it. Was this done, I, I don't know if you mentioned it, but is this, was this done live or? No, um, the, uh, okay. he, my friend, his, his name is Javier. <coughs> he sent me a picture a while ago of his son, not specifically to me, just saying, hey, this is a picture of my son. And uh, most recently, so I looked at it and I saved it and it inspired me and I kept it all this time. And uh, so I did the painting of it uh, a week ago. I will say, uh, I like the idea of you working fast. I never want you to slow down. You know, everyone moves at their own speed, but I want you to put <laughs> your energy not into just the three hours sitting and be done, but like do six of those sittings and see what happens. And uh, I think, uh, I think you'll be surprised and it won't, you and we had some conversation and I think it'll surprise you. It won't necessarily go to just the plain realism. I think no. after a while you'll, you'll evolve. Like you said, you mentioned Caravaggio. He is way beyond realism, Caravaggio. Yes. Who, by the way, was known to get drunk, come home at two o'clock and, <laughs> and he would paint in like two weeks what other great artists couldn't do in three months. Right. And, you know, I think he shot somebody, killed somebody, he and he did. ended up dying at like 26. <laughs> I, think he, I think it was a duel that he uh, ended up getting into and being um, involved in. I, I'm not sure it was a, a gun, but maybe you're right. I don't know. Yeah, it's a, a wild guy. And of course, a big, a lot of contemporary artists and galleries are big fans of Caravaggio. There's no question about it. He's you know, sometimes it's hard to say who is still considered contemporary and why, but Caravaggio is one of those artists who's still in a lot of people's minds. Well, he, the whole advent of uh, Cherescaro, the lighting, the dramatic quality of the light and the shadow. Um, yes, you're right. There are many, many people who do feel as I do about him. He and uh, Rembrandt were two of my biggest uh, influences when I started painting. And uh, certainly one of, in my drawing, though, has gone slightly in a different uh, fashion. 
the uh, thing that I do with the watercolor and the pastel is uh, doesn't doesn't um, allow you to get as deep into the shadows that um, I can get, but I choose not to. Very nice. We had a positive comment. Uh, love the yeah. your portrait from Fran Beeler, and it is Larry Aaron's. Larry Aaron's is the artist who just presented. Thank you, Larry. I, am gonna, I, I have to say. Yes, go I'm ahead. sorry. I have to say just one thing real quick. Um, uh, um, Dan um, uh, Burkholder is one of the uh, a great artists, uh, I think, a contemporary artist, and probably the best teacher I've ever met. Um, and he's famous for saying, you don't get any brand points for how long it took you to make it. Can you repeat sorry, can that, you say Lawrence? You don't, get a, you don't get any brownie points for how long took you to make a piece. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nor do you lose any for how quickly you made it. You know, I think every artist finds their, um, their own groove, their own effort, and their own energy. And wherever it takes them, it takes them. However, you can overwork a painting or put it out before it's really finished. So it's not 100%, Barry. Well, but um, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, um, I, I, Barry, I, can I just segue for a minute to Jane, who was the artist that you had presented last week? I think her name was Jane. Uh, no, you're talking about Julie. Uh, Julie, Julie Harvey. Julie, Julie. So um, I studied her work after I saw the video because I couldn't be part of the, uh, the talk. And I really looked at it very, very hard. And of course, she borders on photorealism. And uh, there is an artist who I sent his name to you, an African-American artist named uh, Kehindi Wiley, W-I-L-E-Y. -E Kehindi. Kehindi. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I saw his work in person, numerous locations. And he, too, borders on that extraordinary uh, feeling of photorealism but his background's very much, and that's what approached in my mind, the same connection to her work. Definitely. So, I, also, I also thought of him in regard to her. Yeah, totally. Right. And uh, okay. then uh, it, it took me to another place. I said, was. oh my God, her people start to remind me of an illustrator that I knew. And then I paused and I said, Mel Ramos. I, didn't, I don't know why, but that's who it reminded me of. But um, I, I think with Julie and Kahanihi Wiley, it's just that they hit the same visual. There yes. was no cross pollination at all. Oh, I agree. And, and I think that's sometimes beautiful mm -hmm. when artists hit something quite unique. Those backgrounds that he do and Julie do are very specific. Um, and yet the somehow, painting. yeah, yeah they, they hit something. Leah wanted. Leah wanted to add something uh, about that. I believe that Julie said that she had been doing those works since 2009, and Kehinde Wiley didn't do them until after that, I believe. Oh, really? OK. Uh, Thank you for clarifying well, that. You know, there was a Maybe very, he saw her work. Maybe. There was a very interesting exhibition. They recreated the Armory Show, which was a very, very significant exhibition that took place, I think, what, in 19. <laughs> 29? Yes. Uh, 19, 19, something like that? 1913. 1913. Give or take a year or two. And the interesting thing about the show was that I saw a group of works and I said, wow, those moreaus are fantastic. And then I looked closer and they weren't moreau, right? Who, who were they? Actually, it happens that artists are thinking about different were ways to express themselves simultaneously in different places. It's quite amazing, but it happens. Right. It, it yeah. happened in mathematics. Uh, Newton uh, invents uh, uh, calculus and Leibniz invents calculus at the same time. You have England and Germany and there was no cross pollination, no internet in those days. And of course, you know, we all sided, I think, with uh, Newton getting the uh, nod on that. But, By uh, the way, Leah, I love your work. It was thank stunning. you very much. I said the same thing. And, and I want to take this opportunity because, you know, 
you, you, there's a lot, a lot of preparation to do a presentation of somebody else's work, much more so than when you do your own presentation. Right. And I can kind of, you know, fly by the seat of my pants on my own work, but when it comes time to being coherent and relevant and interesting to people about somebody else's work, plus I never, I never saw Julie's work until two days before. I never spoke to her until two days. Before. So that was a discovery process, not only for everybody who was viewing, but for myself as well. And in the sure. process of, of doing the, um, the, uh, the conversation, I was learning things fast and furious as well. And I just want to say, Barry, thank you. Not only do you make the opportunity available, but it's a rich opportunity. And I would encourage everybody to get over their shyness, get over their insecurities and dive in. There is nothing nicer than this forum to exercise your ability to talk to people about art. It's really terrific. And the feedback I got was amazing. Well, thank you, I'll vocalize it and tell you it was your work was really very special. <laughs> it takes me a year to do a piece. <laughs> well, you know what? I couldn't do it in any less time. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Thank you. I do want to say Basha Ruth Nelson said, Larry, the painting has soul. And I think thank we you. discussed yesterday, uh, last week, the importance of trying to bring out the soul inside portraiture. So I don't think you can get really a higher compliment than that. Thank you, uh, and Elaine Forrest said, Larry, this painting is very powerful. You've caught the gesture and the personality, the gesture and the personality. And of course, <laughs> Gloria Sampson Knight, which is everybody happy holidays and a wonderful new year. And without taking the opportunity to forget it, I want to wish you all that happy holidays. Thanks for you know being here. Happy new year to everybody. Thank uh, you. We'll have some time at the end to do that. I will move on to Daryl Ann Saunders. Thank you, Daryl Ann, for joining us. Hi. So um, I have to see, I guess I'll share the screen first, because otherwise I won't be able to see that button when I open up the other presentation. So I'll share it first. And um, this is kind of good for me. I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm nervous when I'm talking in front of people. So this is good for me to do this. So just bear with me. Oh, don't um, worry, we're not people. <laughs> <laughs> we're not, we're friends. We're sure. friends and it is, it is about practicing and doing and in a friendly environment. That's what we are. So I guess I'll start out by just giving this a little bit of overview before I, because I won't be able to see your, your faces once I go to the full screen thing. But I'm, this work that I'm presenting is material that um, I'm kind of carving out for a book, an exhibition. I have someone helping me to scan some archive material. Um, there are work print images that document a very special period in the East Village in, of New York City history. And it's the East Village sort of downtown music and art scene and the bands and artists and nightlife and so forth during the early 80s. And um, I just wanted to set the stage a little bit because I don't like to talk too much when I'm showing the images, but um, when I first started shooting this material, it was actually before I was a, a real photographer. I, I attended a punk performance at, at CBGB's, which is this very iconic, grungy, cool place. And um, I was so electrified by it that I had an immediate compulsion to, to document it. Um, I was sort of shy at the time, which is hard for people that know me to believe, but it was, you know, it really brought out the rebel spirit in me. I really wanted to document it. So I got my first camera and that was sort of a catalyst for me. And in fact, I ended up being an editorial photographer uh, after that period. So it sort of launched me into something that I didn't realize I would be doing. Um, and also while I was doing this work, I was at a club and I was approached by the editor of an independent publication called the East Village Eye. And so this fellow asked me, um, oh, were you shooting that band? Can we use some photographs? And so, you know, little by little, I actually became sort of the, one of the lead photographers for that publication and, and an intermittent photo editor. And this gave me a lot of access, sort of a fortuitous access to certain things that was different than if I was just going in. And um, the other thing I, I wanna mention also is, you know, this was before, when you would go to a club, 
this is before everybody was holding up their phone and snapping pictures. So if you went someplace and you had a real camera, you were a real photographer because nobody showed up with like a heavy, you know, 35 millimeter thing with a strobe on it and so forth, unless they were sort of a, a real photographer. And so there were times that I would go to these events and I would be the only person taking any photographs whatsoever. And some of these took place at like Max's Kansas City and CBGB's and these other places. And, um, you know, sometimes I would, I didn't always shoot with the flesh, but sometimes I would pop it because all of a sudden the entire crowd would be like, oh, there's a photographer. Is there somebody famous? And everybody would get really like all kind of excited. And, and, and even the, the band would suddenly start like <laughs> looking toward me sometimes to shoot. So it was just kind of an interesting thing. All right. So enough of that. Um, so let's see. So your name to Annie Leibovitz? What's that? I said, do we change your name to Annie Leibovitz? No, no, she made a lot more money than I ever did. So. <laughs> but her start was very much like yours. Yeah, yeah, she was with like with Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone, yeah. When I click on share screen, do I click on the desktop or my or my presentation? I guess I your, pre your presentation. Okay, so I clicked on share screen. Let's see if this works. So are you seeing my desktop? Uh, yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we see an image. It's hard to know if it's your desktop or your presentation. <laughs> okay, so let me see. But do you see, now do you see a black and white image? Yes. yes. We see it, yes, part of, it part seems of to be cut part off. Of it's cut okay, off. so now that gets me started. Let me just go to full screen mode. Hold on, here we go. So, you it know. It didn't change for no. us. It didn't change. Oh, really? Did you click on your desktop or did you click on the presentation when you shared screen? Um, when I clicked on share the share screen, I clicked on my presentation. There, there. there you go. That's good. Well, That's this perfect. one we see the whole way because it's yeah, horizontal. This is perfect. That's well, it. for some reason, I don't know why this one is not. Let me just see if I, I, maybe I can do the view differently so it shows it better. One second. Is, are you in Photoshop? No. It, it says export PDF, edit PDF. It's a PDF, so I'll go to like. Oh, so you're an acrobat. Okay. The um, single page in, in single page view is where I'm at. Um, one second. Sorry, I'm really sorry about that. One oh, second. this is this is totally fine. I'm just scared you're going to uh, fix it for this, and you're going to mess it up for the other ones, which look really good. See, oh, there you go. You're you're technically swift. You yeah, I want. I do want to show it just to a single. So one second, I'm just trying. To, okay, there we go. Ah, there we go. So what a lot of people didn't realize is it's hard to believe that New York City ever had any areas that look like this. But yes, they did. This is um all in like Lower East Side Avenue A, B. I mean, you had you were taking your life in your hands sometimes to walk around some of these areas. Um, okay. So there's no roof in there. I will say one thing, and that is that I'm open to feedback if you want to send me an email or anything like that. Um, I'm not going to use all of these necessarily for a book. I have others, and these are actually just work prints. These are copies of work prints. So, so I did some of the cultural things. This was um, the 7th Street Women's Shelter. Did any of you guys ever hear of Adam Purple, Adam Purple's Garden? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember him. Is he still alive or? No, 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 but no. this was this was his garden. This was part of that whole. Oh, right, right. Lower East Side, yeah, I remember. Yeah. And that this whole yeah. lot, let people let him sort of take this over. And there was a lot of protests when they actually decided, we're gonna make a, put a building on this site, but it was prime real estate, what can you do? But anyway. Hmm. Now over here, this is Life Cafe. You see it says like life going all the way across. And at the top there, the word, there's like a string of letters and that says life, Life Cafe. And if you made it through Tompkins Square Park alive, this is where, <laughs> this is where you stop to rejoice that you were still alive. Um, Cause it was sort of like a needle park back then. And mm -hmm. this was- talking about 1970s? Yeah, this, this is- um, 80s probably? Early 80s. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned that. Sorry, like nine, nineteen, early nineteen eighties. Yeah, and um, it's no longer there. I live now in Bushwick, and I was very surprised when I moved to Bushwick that the people who owned Life Cafe had opened 
a life cafe in Bushwick. I thought, oh, that's so cool. And so I was just covering a lot of this sort of local culture. This is Double Dutch in the Bronx. And East Village, I had a lot of parties where guys would come and throw down, do break dancing, and it was pretty cool. It was like black, white. I mean, everybody just, it was just a very relaxed atmosphere and a lot of fun. And also during this time period, you know, music sort of was interwoven with art and fashion and all kinds of things. Nice shot. Thank you. I call this one punk wannabes. <laughs> so where are these photos from? Is this CBGBs? Um, this one, I don't know. Actually, I'm, at some point, there's some images I'll put online to ask people if they can identify the band. Most of the bands I know, and I, I actually found, I have these teeny little two-page diaries and I actually scribbled in them where I was going to these various places. And I have from 1980 to 1986, somehow I, I actually held on to that. So, and also with the internet, it's great because if you have the date, you can look it up and then you can sort of backtrack and figure out who it is and where it is. So it's really cool. This is a band called the Butthole Surfers. So some of these places, you, you would that, see this guy like that's by the speakers up front there, that would be like me. I would be jammed up against the stage and I couldn't go to the bathroom. I couldn't drink. I mean, I just, I couldn't get out of the crowd. So on this particular occasion, the, the bouncer, he took, or stage guy, he took pity on me and he just, he sort of dragged me on stage and I was standing up on a big speaker and photographing. And sometimes people were really nice like that. Like I just out of the blue, they would, you know, help me get better photographs. This was Laurie Anderson at the tunnel. Wow. And this is the kind of stuff like when I print this through Photoshop and all that, you see this detail in the faces, I'll be able to bring some of, more of that out, you see? And it's really interesting when you see the audience. James Chance and the Compulsions. Some weeks he was James Black and the Whites. Some <laughs> weeks he was James White and the Blacks. <laughs> and he actually is still playing. Lydia Lunch. Okay. <laughs> Alan Vega of a band mm. called Suicide. Adele Botard and the blood. You hear that noise, you guys? It's not coming from me. There's like a funny, okay. I wasn't sure. So this is sort of like punk royalty here. You've got Richard Hell of Richard Hell and the Voidoids on the far left. You have Johnny Thunders in the middle and Adele Bertai on the right. And this might've been one of the only times that they ever all played together like that. Johnny Thunders passed away. A lot of people, lost a lot of people from drugs and, you know, mm -hmm. all that stuff. 13 year old drummer of the Stimulators, Harley Flanagan. I'm actually in touch with him through Facebook. And he was 13 years old. And sometimes I would be coming in from Queens. I was working two jobs, coming in from Queens to do this. So sometimes they would, his mom would let me <laughs> sleep over. I would be so tired. So they had this like neat little nice and east village that I would sleep over. That's his mom and that's him on the right. Backstage, Richard Hell on the right. Cheetah Chrome of the Dead Boys on the left. Tim Gordon, this is the singer of Sonic Youth. This was outside at St. Mark's. Wow, that's cool. What's that? That's a, that's a cool shot of her. We were so cold. <laughs> I think she was saying to me at that point, would you hurry up and get this over with? <laughs> oh. 
but you know, and I'm, I probably was shaking from, from cold, but I like doing stuff like that. You know, a lot of times with film, people would do like blurred movement with their photography and stuff like that to give a certain edge to things. Hmm. You know, the artist Marilyn Mintner, she's like been at the Brooklyn Museum of Art and everything. I've, I've heard of her. I've heard of her. Famous now. Well, this is her back then. Wrapped up in their art was the title for this. Yeah, she's known for sort of uh, close-ups that go blurry or bubbly in ways. And with jewels and, and all kinds of little diamondy things. Jim Jarmusch on his rooftop. Mm. Greer Langton. Mm. She's actually one of the first artists I ever knew that, well, let's put it this way. I didn't even know then that she was transgender because because I didn't know what transgender was. So I didn't really know, I didn't know what that was about. So we would get into conversations and she would explain things to me. <laughs> well, you certainly sort of captured a part of the punk movement at some point, you know, these are great portraits, but they also become documentation of the era. So they take on another value Besides the street scenes, you know, you've caught these people, like you say, Marilyn Minter, you know, before she is well known, but also these punk moments, they are fleeting um, and you've captured them. Thank you. Well, and also- Sarah Ann, um, this yeah. would make a fabulous book. Well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm working on. I mean, we Good. photograph, I've been scanning um, just the pages of the negatives, and we just got finished with, we actually just got finished with 1985 last week. And because um, I didn't realize that you could do a page of negatives through plastic and it could still actually look so good if it's a good scanner, because I didn't have a digital overview of all the material. So, um, yeah, I mean, this time period also, this could never happen again because you could live in the city then. Artists could live in the city. They could work in the city. They could hang oh, out yeah. in the gallery. They could go and be a secretary somewhere two days a week. They could then work at a cafe. And then they could go out in a, some place and create their art. I mean, you could actually do all of that then. You can't do that now. You know, I mean, you're somewhere else. You're in Brooklyn or you're, you're not there. Well, well oh. one of the things that really impacted the whole scene was the uh, the real estate. Things Things got crazy, like in the mid 90s and it was just it, it was impossible to even live in brooklyn i mean other boroughs it's As a matter fact, the demise of the east village eye is directly attributed to the fact that there was this glut of really cool little galleries that opened up in the east village right and so yeah. when they started to leave the east village they took all their advertising with them the east village eye couldn't survive without the art gallery advertising so it just started so all of these things like you know connect to mm -hmm. yeah sure yeah. This is Jay McInerney of Bright Lights, Big City. That was a big deal then, that book written in the first person. Jim Carroll of Basketball Diaries. I met him at the old Union Square. This is when Union Square was also like a needle park. Mm. And um, we talked and then we did this photograph. Carroll, back in the, uh, believe it or not, the late nineties, I used to go to a dentist on Avenue A and 11th Street. So um, I should take your email just to show you some of the pictures I have of some of the people from that time just hanging out in the street. You, you'd get a smile. Well, I will say that just to say you have it if you're curious or I'll put it in the chat. My email is um, saunders.ok at gmail.com. So it's just S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S dot ok at gmail.com. Well, actually, you know, if you're mentioning Avenue A, I'm just saying, like, that was easy stuff by then. You were really daring if you went to, like, Avenue D. Now okay. you're... <laughs> that was really, you know... I used to show... I don't know if, Are you familiar with Gallery 128? So, what? Uh, are you familiar with Gallery 128? It was on Rivington Street. Oh no! Yeah, lower. Yeah, I, well, that probably in the in the late seventies and eighties, that Rivington Street was still the selling of the clothing and all that stuff. Right. 
Oh, oh no, no. This is this is like um, uh, let me see. I guess it would be below Orchard, or I'm I'm trying to remember. I, uh, Delancey would be like below Delancey, but uh, it was run by a Japanese woman, um, uh, Kazuko Miyamoto, and it was a really neat gallery for many, many, many years. I think it's still running too. Oh, sounds. So I'm gonna. I'll go. Through these. I don't want anybody to become bored about looking at this. So I'll try to go through a little more quickly. This is Alexa Hunter of a band called Disturbed Furniture. And so what happened is I started to get to know people and I would go to their places and photograph. And that actually made it possible for me to put together a portfolio of work. And that's how I first started getting my, my first like real magazine shoots. Like I went to Forbes and I guess they'd had a group talk that they wanted more interesting stuff. And I happened to walk in at the right time because I thought that they'd laugh me out of the place with this music photography, but um, you never know. I guess that's the point. Dave Insurgent of Reagan Youth. Penelope, she's the director of Decline of the Western Civilization. She worked on Roseanne. She did a whole bunch of movies people don't know about. I think that's the, I think that's the last one of this group. Yeah, okay. So I'll unshare my screen or do you want me to kind of go back through some stuff or whatever? I'm sorry, you can unshare and then we'll open it up to dialogue. Yeah, they're wonderful. I'll go through it really, really, really fast, really quick, just so you can see it again without blabbing. I mean, without my blabbing, by the way, not you guys. <laughs> it's funny about uh, some of these uh, back in the 70s. I wasn't a photographer. I was a musician on stage. Where am I? Oh, really? These are so wonderful. One of my best friends lived in the East Village of this era. So I was down there a lot. And it really brings back the flavor. I'm glad, that's great. That really is great. And you know, these are just um, like scans of prints. These aren't even like the negatives. So you can see like they're very sharp. I mean, you could have just, you know, a not great camera, a decent lens and you, you know, you just. I mean, I was really, really working at looking. Hmm. Okay, so I'll stop. I'll stop the share. Okay. Whew. Really wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> very Excellent. nice. Really good. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it very much. So yeah, so I'm. I have a lot more material to go through and. Um, I think one of my biggest concerns, which I'm curious about, is um, people that haven't gone through this or aren't New Yorkers, I don't know how interested they would be in this material. So that's, and that's part of why I wanted to sort of speak to the historical aspect of it, like the street scenes and the things that sort of stamp it at that time. It's not just like a rock and roll series or a punk series or whatever. So um, I, I don't know, you know, I have students who are middle school, high school, college age, and they, they talk about the scene and they ask me questions, you know, were you there? Did you know this group and that group? And they know some of these, you know, punk groups and metal groups and whatever. And I don't know about them, but I'm like, wow, you're 15 and you're asking me. So I don't know. I think there would be broader interest. I don't think it's just... It's funny that because um, I was showed some work in an ICP class. I was doing a presentation and I just thought it would be like one of those click, click, click. They stopped me at almost every frame. I'll bet. You no, know, because there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of wish of having been through that time. Like, you know, a lot of us got to go through some pretty cool stuff. Yeah. You know, Daryl, you know, yeah. Daryl Land, do you remember Fillmore East? Sure. Oh, yeah. 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 Second I Avenue. Where was that? Where was it again? Um, Second, Second Avenue. I can't remember the streets. One no, of the East, East Street, I think East, it was. East Village. Uh, 
East like Village, Seventh, yeah. Seventh Street. Seventh. Right, mm. right, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, all these places, though, I only went to places where I could really shoot. You know what I mean? Like, you notice all these places are small. Like, I went to, right. you know, CDs, Max's, TR3, Hurrah's. I have these really, I mean, I think amazing images of um, Iggy Pop at Hurrah's with his shirt off doing his bit. And I didn't even realize till I was going through all the material that at one point he's looking right at me. And I almost <laughs> dropped the negatives. It's like, whoa, you know, because you don't, sometimes you don't realize the access you can have when you're that close to people. So when I would go to places like the Ritz or Irving Plaza and I had to be up in a balcony, it just wasn't, wasn't this very satisfying. It wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go to um, Cockroach Art on Bleecker Street? Where? Cockroach Art. It was across, across the street from the bitter end. No, Cockroach Art, huh? I'm running some of these things down, but no, I've never, I, I probably wouldn't want it. I had a problem with cockroaches in my apartment at that time. <laughs> um, we all did. Daryl Ann, there's one thing that I thought was um, just slightly often if you're presenting this to a broader audience. So that first picture you showed with the hole in the door and it looked pretty down and out. And you said, this is, you know, I bet you can't believe there are places in New York that look like this. Well, there are still places in New York that look like that. So I would just be careful because some people might see that and say, whoa, what, what rock is she living under? You know, yes, the East Village has really gentrified. But now those yeah, places. I'd like to know, not to challenge, but I'd like to know where in Manhattan there are places like that with buildings with. Um, I've passed them. Oh, <laughs> Harlem. Um, West Santa Broadway. Harlem. West Broadway was like that. Oh, West well, Broadway. Not now. Now? I thought, now. now. No, but I'm talking about now. Yeah, definitely. Because I certainly, I don't want to insult anyone by saying, oh my God, look at this horrible place. And guess what? You just happen to live there. So. Well, no, I'm sure they don't live in that exact place. But just no, no. there, no, there certainly are. It's just moved around. You know, when one area gets gentrified, everything gets pushed into some other area that you probably wouldn't walk around in now. Because well, that's a good point that you make. And maybe what I, maybe what, maybe it would be what I mentioned that there were like entire blocks like this. And I don't think you see entire blocks like that too much in Manhattan, you know, Manhattan proper, so to speak. But yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Well, you, you I, know, the Voice is now republishing, uh, right? What's that? The, the Village Voice is now republishing. Oh, really? I don't know. That's great. Yeah, so I was oh. going to suggest that it seems like a venue that you could knock on their door and say, this is what the world was when you were back then. How about doing something now? No, I think that's a great idea. I didn't, I was really sad when it was like the end of an era, you know, Soho right. News and Village yeah. Voice, all these publications that, huh. that's great. So uh, yeah, definitely. Is it, are they only existing online though? Or are they going to print, do you know? I don't have an answer for you. I'll check it out, I'll find out, that's great. Yeah. I will say, you know, to something that was said, yes, there is this resurgent interest in the 80s and in that scene. And yes, it can be young people, like you said, Fran, teenagers. And also when I play that music at times, I find 80 year olds, 70 year olds really enjoying it. I think you've captured something. The book idea is brilliant. Um, definitely, uh, it, it's an era that, you know, the city has moved on. It still has terrible areas and you know, you don't have to look too far. There are nooks and corners, but you don't have blocks and blocks of burnt out, terrible neighborhoods right. like you had. Um, some would say the sort of gentrified areas are terrible in another way. They become very plastic and they're missing. There's certainly a lot of character and a lot of possibilities that came out of those tough areas and also provided cheap or in that, that era, free housing for squatters, for artists who really stayed. So there's that weird mix where for a city to, to be dynamic, it almost needs that. And when it gets totally cleaned up, it becomes- It's like it, Disneyland. And actually speaking to something you just mentioned, Barry, that is that um, you just reminded me, I came across some material where um, I actually did photograph some squatters. It was one of those things where you had to know somebody, you know somebody, they had to bring me in. It was like secret. I couldn't talk about it. When we published some of the photos, you couldn't say where it was, but these were people who were stringing, you know, stringing wire and extension cords out to the street. And it was really, 
And but on the other hand, um, they were not they were not vagrants. I mean, these were just they were regular people. You know, like we tend to, um, you know, we, anyway. Sometimes we we sort of gen, you know generalize um, about all this. I remember also when um, when the first gap wanted to open up, I think it was right near Tompkins Square Park and it was unheard of. It was just absolutely unheard of, that idea of the East Village having a Gap store. So everybody protested and did rallies. Uh, I remember that, oh, it's so funny. Yeah, have you read um, Patty Smith's book, Just Kids? It made great. me think of that book and that era, you know? Yes, great book, by the way, If you have, for everybody, if you haven't read it. I do want to move forward. Uh, Jill Gerwitz is going to present. Uh, thank you very much. And after Jill, we're going to have Omar Noble discuss one of his recent works. Omar's a friend of mine who I haven't seen in a while. Nice to see you here, Omar. I look well, forward to you sure. yes, well, I, I just wanted to thank you guys very much. For, and if you have any questions or thoughts or anything at all, please feel free to put it in the chat or email me. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Sure. Quick question. Does anybody live on Long Island? Yes, I, I live on Mike, Long Island. Okay, my friends. The only reason I'm saying that is uh, there is a, an art gallery that is out in Oyster Bay. It's called the Bar B A H R Gallery that only has 60s psychedelic art. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody is out there, it's really quite a very interesting uh, place to stop in. Hey, Mitch, how are you? It's Larry. Hey, Larry. Yeah, um, that gallery showed at, I think, one of the art fairs from the Hamptons a couple of years ago. Yeah, he might have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those are classic posters. Oh, they're just unbelievable posters. And all of them are in pristine. I left them upstairs. Anyhow, just sharing. Very nice. Uh Jill, take it away. You want to share some works that you've done. Uh, and Jill, let us know where you are, what part of the city. Sure. Um, I'm in the Lower East Side, and um, I'm actually a New Yorker, um, like born and raised. Um, I think I'm going to um, pl actually play one of my songs. I'm also a songwriter. Um, so wow, I'm Jill, wait, wait. You're an artist and a songwriter, and you're I living am. in the place that Daryl Ann was just showing us? I, well, I, I, you know, in the seventies, no one went there. So, um, but it's it's definitely, you know, uh, we know, evolved, evolved, yeah, you know, it's very exciting. And also to see New York, um, you know, I mean, I remember when Times Square was, you know, you have to sort of run there. Um, there's a lot of pornography. It was very dangerous. Um, you know, certain areas of the city were very dangerous, um, but also, um, you know, it's, and also the, well, there was the music scene was really great um, on Bleecker Street in the, in the village. You're very um, far away from your speaker. And oh, I'm, sorry, sorry. Thank you. So I'm gonna um, just talk a little bit about um, my recent work, and I'm gonna play one of my songs actually. Um, what I've noticed like during COVID is I work in a hospital. Um, so in some ways my life hasn't really changed. Um, although on the weekends, maybe I'm not, um, maybe I'm quarantining when home, but uh, like in some ways my life hasn't changed. And, and initially when it started at COVID in March, I was doing watercolors, which I'd never done before. Um, and I spent a lot of time in a sort of meditative practice doing watercolors. But more recently, I've moved on to um, doing collages, which I've done before. I'm um, doing a little bit less photography than I have. Um, but I'm going to share the screen and then also. Let's see. So I'm going to show a little bit of my Instagram page. And my album is called um, To Amuse. Oh, you know what? I think I did something. Um, I'm gonna un unshare for a minute, and then share.
was very nice. I really liked it coupled with the images, Jill. Awesome. Oh, thanks. I just have a couple more and then maybe these are um, actually uh, it's photo sculpture. Um, and I used to do it when I was a kid where I used silicone adhesive and build it up. So it's multiple images sort of built up. Um, should I stop or? No, go ahead a little more. That's fine. I really think it's a good idea, like, for you to integrate your music with sort of a slideshow um, of your work, like you did for us, but to sort of make that almost a part of a, you know, I guess it's like an, uh, maybe a 1980s uh, video presentation. It's very old school, but it seems to work because you're talking about New York, New York, and then you're showing us the images. So I think they open each other up. Thanks. I think I'll just do this, this one. So I think that leaves me off from where I just sort of updated you on some of the, um, my Instagram things that I've been working on recently. But thanks, that Barry. That's a really great idea, especially with series. I think that would be really, really great yeah. idea. And also, what a nice, what a nice follow up to Daryl Ann, who is capturing. You know, <laughs> we we don't plan this, but it sort of happens, and I like that synchronicity where you know she had the images of the music, and you came with the music, and you brought us a newer New York. That, and of course, she was in black and white, you were in color, but a lot of those images still spoke to a broken city in ways. And so, you know, it's uh, a very nice follow up, uh, Jill. Oh, thanks. I agree. They work so well together. Of course, I was going to say exactly the same thing. So, I love the combination of the images with the music. It just brought it to life and felt like uplifting and connected. and. <laughs> And, and I love how, without it being planned, it's like a, a little theme is happening and this has happened to us before. Somehow it just comes together in the end. So really beautiful, Jill, I love it. Your Thank work you looks so great. After 9-11, people were saying, oh, New York will never be the same again. And Whoever's I speaking, please get closer to your mic. Yeah, can you hear me? I said, after 9-11, after people around, and I was in Soho, so I was nearby, people were saying, oh, New York will never be the same again. And I, and I said, sure it will, but it never was the same again. Something shifted. And I think COVID is going to be the same impact. Something has shifted. It will never be the same again. Looking at these images, I almost wanted to tear up thinking about you know, the loss of, of what was familiar, what was right there for us day in and day out. Things are going to change again. These uh, documents are all that much more important. Yeah, it's almost like each disaster strips away like our innocence more and more. 9-11, okay, you have to be afraid of terrorists. COVID, now you can't touch anybody. So I really enjoyed the music, Jill. It was great. Thank you. Really nice. Oh, nice to your voice again. In a way, this city is like our skin. We shed a layer and a new layer of skin comes up. And this city constantly evolves. That's, you know, one thing you've seen if you've been around New York. And there's a lot of creatives here. And there's a there's like this incredible mix in New York City. And yes, the artists capture it. Very nice. I, I am going to move forward. There were some beautiful comments. Uh, Basha Ruth Nelson, great combination. Love it. Elaine Forrest, Jill, that was just terrific. Um, Fran Beeler, Jill, love that song. And I'll agree, I love that song. Um, and, uh, and the slideshow together. Um, so very nice thoughts. Do take a look in the chat, everybody. I'm gonna move to uh, Omar Noble. Omar, so nice to see you here. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Omar. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I haven't been doing, I haven't been painting for like years, so I just started again, but like I, my creative process is like always going. Um, 
So I'm just going to show a few things. This is um, this is COVID. This is the creation. Um, it's just one of the masks that I've I've, I've worked on since COVID. Um, these are this is done really from like things that are just laying around the house. That you is know, wonderful. Fabrics. Can you can we see it for another minute? Huh? Oh. Can we see it? Can we see it a little longer? That's great. Okay. okay. I have to see a little. Wait, I got to make it bigger in the screen here. Hang on. So it's a collage, a collage mask. Yeah, basically. Oh. So That's just so things that are laying around. Um, I put together these. This, um, these are like um, beer cans, uh, beer tops. Oh yes. You know, um, a lot of leather and things like that. But I have a painting that I just started. And I, I wanted to do a thing on uh, Brooklyn. And um, so I'm just going to show it. It's just laid out. So I'm going to show and see if you can give me some critique on it. I like his big discipline in the background. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's my motto. <laughs> so I don't know if you can see this. Oh, it looks good. Oh, yeah. Wow. This is a painting. Yes, a paint. I'm just. I just started working on it um, recently, but this is my my entry back into the art world. Really wonderful. Oh, thank you. So, it's like uh, two two worlds coming together there. Yeah, that's that's the theme. Um, you know, is is the old and the new, and and how they influence each other. Mm. So, Omar, tell like everybody a, a little bit about your background in fashion. Um, yeah. Oh, um, I'm like really. That's my my forte is fashion. So, uh, but let me let me um, show a few other things real quick. Such a feeling of discovery when people discover when people wander around and they're like plucking things from their studio to show. It's kind of cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't wait. There's so much to choose. Actually, I haven't been like these are just things that I just started working on. This was um this was um an African piece that I'm doing. And there are a lot of characters that go around me. So this is kind of inspired by um Barry. <laughs> Thank you. It, it also seems like, even though it's one figure, it just also has that feeling. It's like um, the past, but it's a robot. You know, it's like the yeah. present and the past put together somehow. Yeah, it's kind of political stuff. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of political stuff. But that was it. I just wanted to critique on the big one and, um, you know, get an idea of where I'm going. So. Uh, on the big one, maybe can you bring it a little bit closer to the camera just so we can see a part of it. Oh, okay. You could see it a little more in some detail maybe, if you don't mind. Let's see what you can do. Oh, there you go. If you go to the speaker view, it really makes a difference. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you can hit the three dots in his rectangle yeah. and, and uh, pin him. That's one way to make it larger. Yeah, it's hard to see the whole thing because Oh, you know what? Uh oh. <laughs> oh Upside down. No, but this is great. This really, it's really great to see it this way. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get an idea. I like it much better than when, when it was far away. New York meets. My question was, is that supposed to be Harlem in the background and and the people are in African dress? Yeah, they're in African dress. Um, and there's the a lot of activity going on that's current in the background. You know, we have like, Is that you know, an orthodox and, figure walking towards the left? Yeah, I, I live on, I live across the street from the Brooklyn Museum. Oh, oh. So this is this is my portrait of the Brooklyn Museum. As you can see, 
This is a Brooklyn Museum right here. Oh, yo, right. They have that big sculpture up front. And this is basically what goes on in my neighborhood. I think you forgot to paint her pants. Right. Come on. Oh, she's wearing tights. Oh, no, I, I, I just Leggings. laid it out. I haven't finished it yet. I'm just laying it out. I'm, I'm seeing a woman's ass over there. <laughs> it's oh, right here? Yeah, pink leggings, pink leggings. She's, leggings. she's got running shoes in my neighborhood all day and all night. So she's just a jogger. And then there's another one. She's walking her dogs. And I mean, you know, it's a lot of, lot of stuff that's going on. And it's acidic. It's in this acidic neighborhood. So, right. you know, yeah. So I'm just trying to get all the elements in. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is mm -hmm. so. so Omar, that's not Harlem in the background. That's actually um, the Brooklyn area of where the museum is. Yeah, this is Brooklyn. This is okay. these, are, these are the PJs. Okay. We talk about Red Hook and all okay. that just over there. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to incorporate everything that into one into one piece. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what direction I'm going in, but you know. How long have you been working on it, Omar? Um. Actually, I'm doing, I, I, I can't give you hours because uh, in all actuality, I'm doing uh, 3D stuff most of the time. So once in a while, I'll like, it's, it's hanging. So once in a while, I'll pick it up, pick up a brush, and then I'll, I'll work it that, that way. Beautiful. Thank you, Omar. So nice Omar, to meet you. I have to see you. I have to say that uh, George Harrison said uh, a song, um, if you don't know where you're going, then any way you go will get you there. <laughs> say that again? If you, if you don't know where you're going, then any way you go will get you there. <laughs> you know, I'm still thinking about your masks. I, I think there's such a fashion statement and the fringe is outstanding. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I've been working on these things for a while. Like, because um, I'm not, I'm not going out without a mask. Mm. Yeah. So like I, I mask up in the house, but like, you know, like I, I, um, my roommate, like I'm always in a mask. He doesn't even know what I look like. <laughs> in the last. <laughs> so, but I have a bunch of these things that I, since I'm in. Oh, I love that. <laughs> 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 Omar, you said you do a lot. You're doing 3D. What does that mean? What are you doing 3D? Um, I I do um, animation. Like I build I build models. Um, I build characters. I build a set, <coughs> um, and then I animate it. Oh wow. Um, I wish I could show you some of that, but I don't know how to pull up the screen and do all that kind of stuff. We'll do it another time, and you and I will practice beforehand. It's really easy to do. I am okay. going to move forward to uh, Lawrence. Lawrence wanted to share some of his work. Okay. Omar, again, so nice to see you. Oh, thank you. I thank everybody. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thanks, Omar. Don't forget to check your comments there. Beautiful. Okay. Wonderful work. Oh, yes. Daryl Ann, Ann, Ann Sanders said, Omar loved the large painting. You may want to take uh, pictures to document as it changes. Fran Beeler, Omar, love those masks. Uh, Jill uh, said, amazing painting. Um, and of course, there was uh, Elaine asked the question about the setting. And I even, when looking at it, I thought it was South Bronx setting. Said <laughs> but, uh, you know, again, you've taken like our previous artists, you've captured the city around you. And you know you've translated it your way through painting. So again, artists often can be working with the same material, but how they, what media they use and how they translate it can come out in different forms. But again, you're looking around you, you're seeing, and what you said, uh, I don't know where it's going. That is a common thought in artists, and I've seen it many times where artists they are exploring something new and they don't know where it's going. And that's a great feeling as an artist. It, it sort of starts a new path, like a new branch on a tree. You don't know where it'll evolve. And so that's an exciting thing. And 
it also keeps us young. Definitely does. Well, I'm, I'm, I'll say this to in, in my part. I'm very inspired by what I've seen from the artists so far. So you, this is a great push for me. Oh, it's in, yeah. The masks also look really nice uh, around your neck as a as a oh, collar. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It works both ways. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Lawrence. Lawrence, a photographer, as I know, um, and is presented before and always showed a variety of interesting work. So welcome, Lawrence. You're in New York City, am I correct? Or I am 12 feet from New York State in Connecticut. Oh. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a house that was built in 1800 on a uh, foundation built in the uh, early uh, 1700s, 1731 or 34. Wow. <laughs> it's a fun place. <laughs> and I have the best neighbors. Uh, Michael J. Fox is, is in the next house over. Wow. But anyway, uh, yes, let's see. I got the share screen. There we go. Barry, how do I unpin? How do you unpin? On the left hand side. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you. There's unpin. Wow. No one, Elaine. I like that quick response. Hmm. That's because my speaker is not muted. <laughs> you can talk all the time, but you just can't hear me. <laughs> oh. oh. Very cool. Yeah, real cool. It's got a comic book feel to it. I'm going through these fast because I, um, I got inspired to show these because of something that Daryl Land said early in the conversation here um, um, about Soho Photo. And uh, this, this was my post Soho Photo time uh, two years ago. Um, I. Um, yeah, I went through a, a really bad year, <laughs> and um, I wound up just uh, doing lots of these things. I, oh, if somebody, anybody can come up with a name for this, I've been calling them framed frames. Uh, I've never uh, liked they, the name. My, my kids would call them Inceptions from the movie <laughs> Inception. Ah. Worlds within worlds and layers. Now I'm going to write that down. Have you seen the movie Inception? No. Oh my God. Well, you might want to see the movie if you like sci-fi fantasy kind of stuff. Okay. I'm not commenting just because I don't want to slow down. <laughs> There's too many of them in this Tell me a little bit about your images. Some of them look like they have been um, played with in Photoshop to make them look like paintings, or are they paintings? Uh, they're not paintings, no. This is all photography. Uh, that's um, uh, Mark Cassani uh, there. And this was at um, uh, somebody from the ATOA. Um, oh, gosh. Um, Molly Barnes, um, who does these brown bag lunches as well as ATOA things. I think she was a board member for, for many years, way back when. And uh, this particular one was um, the composer there composes works for about artists' works. And in this particular day, he was playing a piece that was inspired by Marcus Stodden. And um, <clears throat> I haven't looked at these in two years. Uh, so I, I did it for, I guess, about two or four months uh, doing these things. Uh, you're seeing some repetitive stuff, but. What is your thinking behind the putting the frames within frames? At the time, I wasn't really thinking. <laughs> I was recovering <laughs> from being bruised by I, I had a significant other who had a stroke uh, about a year before this, and um, I was her 24-7, and um, it ended badly. 
And uh, it was during that time that um, I, uh, rather than being on hand at uh, Soho Photo uh, for just about anything that was, uh, uh, she, uh, she, the strokes had uh, hit the part of her brain where everything nice comes from. And so she was a raving lunatic and I didn't sleep for 10 months. Oh and uh, it was during that time that the Soho Photo decided to put me on trial for uh, having answered the question, do you work here? <laughs> and it was like, excuse me, <laughs> you doing what? I, all I did was answer the question, do I work here? Honestly, which was nobody works here. We're all volunteers and uh, da, 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 da. Larry, I mean, uh, uh, Lawrence, see the left side of this one. See what, what you're doing reminds me of uh, Apocalypse Now in the beginning in the film. They do a beautiful photo montage and it's very hard to do. And it's very rare that cinematographers or directors do it. They layer images and they sort of, uh, they create more than the one image. Um, when you do this work, the, the outline works against you at times. But on the left here in this one, the outline is not, uh, in, it's not holding each image to itself. And so you get that montage on the left edge for about, you know, one eighth of it. And that to me starts to create a sort of multi-layered uh, effect that I think is, is more powerful Whereas at other times I'm getting a rectangle and a rectangle, which has a very strong conceptual read, or let's say a rhombus and a rhombus. You have a strong conceptual read, but you get more of a, it's almost like a chiaroscuro effect, especially in the top one quarter where you've got so many different images that they're merging and I'm not able to dissect them. And I think that's an advantage. Um, it's just my thought, by the way, um, but it's, it's something I, I've known. I like your thought. Well, Lawrence, can you go, where, where, this looks familiar to me. Where is the Keith Haring thing? Where is this? This is the Keith Haring bathroom. Where though? Um, in the, um, uh, the LGBT, et cetera, uh, headquarters. Um, yes, I believe so, yes. Oh, I've seen it, okay. Thank you. I just. Ah, and answering the question before, are these Photoshop? I'm a, I teach Photoshop, but I'm not doing these in Photoshop. I'm, I'm mostly working on uh, iPad um, uh, apps. Um, much of this is probably, if I remember correctly, I'm almost positive it was uh, Snapseed. Oh, what? Uh, it's called Snapseed. It's uh, an app for the iPad that uh, Google uh, makes and they update it all the time. You, you can do it on any phone too, Snapseed. Yes. Uh, not with my eyes though. <laughs> I would need much stronger glasses if I was trying to do that. And also I'm, I'm doing a lot of finger work so it, uh, it would be really difficult to where do on the iPhone. Where's that ceiling from? The ceiling? Ceiling back there. Ah, Grand Central. Yes, Grand Central. Is that Grand Central? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is ceiling? Is it Macy's? That was Macy's, I believe it was Macy's, yes. That's right around the corner. Macy's is around the corner from where I live. I live on the uh, right next to Penn Station. So hearing the story about the difficulty with sleeping and so forth, it's sort of interesting, this um, fragmented view, you know, because when we don't sleep well, everything, uh -huh. Oh. It's almost like a cacophony of visual stimuli and stuff like that. So I don't know if that was deliberate, but I'm just saying knowing that story adds something to the way you articulated this in photographs. Interesting. Okay. Um, <clears throat> these particular ones were inspired by uh, the death of one of the best photographic artists I ever met. Um, and I knew him for 30 years, um, a fellow by the name of Trevor Augustus Brown or Trevor Brown. Um, <clears throat> he had um, he passed away and um, 
on his death, I uh, found myself <laughs> lost because, uh, well, for various reasons. And um, in my mind, he was um, he was saying, oh, if you're not feeling good, then go take <laughs> just go take pictures. And so this is what this is about. Uh, some, some of these, not all of these, but any of them. It's not coming up. Quite a few of them, of course, I recognize the locations. Mm -hmm. Bet you can't guess where this was. <laughs> 42nd Street. <laughs> Union Square. 34th Street. Which one? Times Square. <laughs> <laughs> New York somewhere. Madison Square Garden. So Barry, you're saying you're saying that if suggesting if if uh, he took the white uh, border off of the multiple images, they would merge in a satisfactory way. Yeah, I think you'd get uh, you'd get the images working together as opposed to staying separate by the uh, rhombus like background, the the line, the edges. Um, on the other hand, you get something else from the sort of image in the image. But see the top right corner there? See how the lines are not lining up? And it's almost like a cubist painting of a whole bunch of things. And even in the bottom of this, where the space is not recognizable, but it's going back and forward, and he's creating a new space. Whereas the middle image in this, it, it holds its own flat two-dimensional form even though, of course, it has an image in it that recedes. So, you know, just playing with that, maybe just losing the edges is all. And I, again, I, I only give this as an idea, you know, the... Um, God, yeah. Why is this not working? I'd love to see that. It sounds really amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's really amazing. You know, it almost has a feeling of uh, an Escher piece where you know you're going in and you're traveling and coming back up as well, and I, I say that in the best of ways. I have the highest regard for M. C. Escher, who is getting to the day again. He sort of was everybody's favorite when they were young, but it seems like serious art history has forgotten him. Yeah. It's almost, it's almost like it would be 3D if you lost the edges. I almost feel like I'm going through a movie of the paintings. This is Brooklyn. I must say your photos of these uh, bathrooms are really interesting subject matter. Is this was a storefront window. That's a very popular one. You can see how that pops in its own way. That makes it easy. So Lawrence, a quick cool question is to your picture within picture within picture. Um, what is your first step in how you approach this? Do you work from your back image coming forward or do you take your front image and allow it to draw the uh, shape going backward. The front image is the is the first image, and everything beyond that is um, uh, is creating a focus for my brain other than my life <laughs> at the time. <laughs> okay. And that's it. We just went through 75. Wow. Oh, that was a lot of work. I'm also curious, like for you as an artist, um, the, the feeling of repetition, what draws you to the image on top of an image? Just what draws you artistically? Hmm. Curious question. I, I would get the best answer I can perhaps give is that I, it is true that I was a uh, photographer first. I'm sorry, a musician first. And something about music is that is repetition. As a matter of fact, um, I was going to make a comment earlier on. I, I think Barry had said something about, uh, you know, what may, we, we all, you know, talking about the watercolors, about if you make a mistake, how blah, blah, blah. And Barry was talking about working with uh, uh, 
uh, paper um, paper towels and how if you get, put too much on, then all of a sudden the thing starts falling apart or something. And um, uh, in uh, there was there used to be a wonderful wonderful lead guitarist who was playing with the um, the unholy mole rounders and uh, this was at cockroach art the place where i was I mentioned earlier and um it was uh, i was sitting with him with a few a few friends and we're like you know how do you do how do you do this great stuff great stuff this is just what you know what do you mean great stuff it's you know that i i, I hear these recordings that you're you know, that he's playing we were playing at the time records you were playing and he says i oh, i shouldn't have done this I should have done this instead and blah, 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 blah. And uh, one of the other people sitting in the room said, uh, well, you know, really it's all about, you know, making the mistakes work. So you hit the wrong note. All you have to do is hit it again, make it count. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> very, very nice, Lawrence. Uh, uh, positive comments uh, from Jill Gerwitz, Lawrence, very intriguing. intriguing. Um, Extremely powerful from Basha Ruth Nelson. Um, Elaine Forrest, intrigued by the graininess of the images. They do look like paintings. Great shot. It says, I love New York. Um, Susan Tiffin, I love the color treatment. Um, you know, very positive responses. And uh, Lawrence, I think you've presented a few times. And each time you show us a different side of how you use photography as your tool. And they're always slightly different sides. And I, I do like that. I like that. And of course you flesh it out in the full body of work, not one or two pieces. And you showed us 70, you probably have more. And you know, you, you're prolific. That is without a doubt a cornerstone, I think. I mean, obviously Vermeer, 25 paintings, that's it. But you can often tell an artist by the fact that he makes so much art. <coughs> Also, so many pieces, so many works. It's sort of part of it. It's uh, it's like if you like chocolate, you eat a lot of it. You know, you don't just have one piece. So that's my food analogy. I do want to, <laughs> I do want to ask uh, Michael Krasowitz if you want to present. I think you had mentioned it in the chat. I'm happy to go along. And I, Michael, are you having your group uh, this Thursday or not? Because if it's uh, New Year's Eve. So I, I, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't know if you want to keep going at 7.38. Um, I'm not going to do the salon until the new year. And then I'm going to change the day to Wednesday nights. So it's going to okay. be Wednesday night at 7. I so do want to mention Michael does a salon. That's a great way to present. Very similar to this. He does a great job. Great dialogue. Brings in, he brought in an opera singer. One of the brings in music. Sort of mixes it all up. I'd say, Michael, give us a short one. Go ahead. I, I started us a little late and I'm always a little long-winded. And, you know, Michael's gonna show some of his, uh, I think it was his uh, painted clothing he wanted to share. Well, actually, you know, maybe I'll do this other thing just because, uh, <laughs> okay. I, I just did a, uh, sorry guys, I wasn't sure I was doing this tonight. Um, I'm making a, a, 20, a, 20, a 2020 painting presentation. So if it's, um, sorry guys no, that's okay I do want to say that the point I was making to Lawrence everyone try and see Apocalypse Now watch the beginning of that film for the montage that is done with image on image and how it bleeds in and you'll understand why Francis Ford Coppola couldn't keep doing that it's too much work and it, it really is quite valuable cinematographers very rarely do it because it takes a lot of effort. So when you get a chance to see that in a film, you want to sort of soak it up. You really do. It's just, uh, it is, it creates something beyond a montage of photographs. I, just because you said that, I, I have to <laughs> make two comments. One is um, there are two Apocalypse Nows, the original one and the remake by, uh, by the, the director's cut about 10 years ago. The director's cut is so 
much better than the original because it brings together everything makes sense there was so much about apocalypse the, the original that didn't make sense including the very last scene which as it turned out uh the only reason that they included that last scene was because when they finished filming they had all these armaments left over that they didn't use all these uh, uh you know things to blow up and so what they decided to do instead of carting them out because they would have had to get special permission to move them around again and this that the other thing that they just blew them up and filmed it that's why that last scene is there the only reason as an example um, um the, 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 the other thing was uh, i forgot you get it. if i remember i'll come back well i'm really liking this painted uh ah. Now I remember. Did I yeah, show it? I'm sorry. Now I remember. Last night I saw a movie for the first time, a black and white from 1931, as I recall. It's called The Front Page and talk about cinematography. Oh my God. Unbelievable cinematography. Storyline, not so weird. But <laughs> the acting and the cinematography, phenomenal. Can we see a second image? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm thinking of Omar's mask, so I, I thought maybe this would be best to pull up. Um, so these are, uh, sorry, it's going to be, uh, I don't know how to do this here. So this, this series I started in 2014. I've done it for about, like, I guess, off and on for the last five or six years. And, uh, you know, my, my idea was to uh, walk around, bring the, get the art off the wall and present it in the public sphere. Try to make a statement about art in, in our culture. So, um, so are these was, uh, are the that you created the uh, paintings or the graffiti that you put down? No, this is uh, each each piece is hand painted, and it's my my style of working where I create spontaneously. I, I don't know what I'm going to do till I, till I start doing it. Um, I said this was this was the select art fair, I guess in 2016 or 17. So the painting was on the wall. And then I had a group of models walking around in the clothes. So that, then that was the original idea. I was starting to do some art fairs and I got the idea that I would um, wear these, the jackets as a way of kind of getting the work off the wall and getting the work into a, to make it an immediacy to it. Right. Instead of reacting to something on the wall. And the story is this man on the right is an art. I was on the plane going, I was doing art I, one year I was, I was kind of paying to get into a bunch of art fairs. So I did Art Basel in Miami. And on the plane going down there, I met, I met, I met him and I started telling him what, that I paint art clothes. And he goes, oh, I love art clothes. And he bought the, this jacket. And then I did a show in the city on 28th Street. This was a design salon. The paintings are in the background and then they came and we all wore the art clothes. Yeah. Um, this is another piece from that same show. So the, I'm, I'm really interested in, uh, in getting the work, recontextualizing how people interact with art. I think that, you know, gra graffiti at one point, if you think of Keith Haring and, and that, that era, graffiti and street art was the way to get the art into a public sphere. So I was thinking, what could be a contemporary uh, version of that? And the fact that now we can print fabric so easily with our designs, I, I make a, like, I print on anything. So this is my, this is my wallet. I put a, the painting on my wallet. I'm putting it on every product that I can get my hands on. I even have a credit card with one of my paintings on it. Mastercard did it for a while. So you know, it's it's putting it into a place where somebody says, "Oh, that's an interesting piece," or whatever, and they react to it. In, in this in the kind of the public sphere and like I said now I've been doing this thing with TikTok I'm trying to do TikTok things because I think that's where the uh, the social interaction is right now <clears throat> and then I've done you know I've I, I've taken these to art fairs I did the LA art fair and I had people walking around and it's it I don't know I guess it's kind of fizzled in a little bit because of COVID and everybody's locked down but hopefully when, uh, when things come back, I'll, I'll start doing it again. I was kind of settled into jeans. I thought jeans was a good uh, and kind of fun thing to react to. Let me see if I can see it. 
I like it very much, Michael. You know that I've seen these before, and I'm, I'm a big fan. I think your color palette, I think it's commercial in the best way possible, and that people would want to buy that and wear it. Um, it's very accessible. It's definitely, you know, it's like your paintings. You know, you're involved in relationships between figures. You probably have your own meaning, or your own symbolism. Uh, it's very much your stamp. And I like that idea of, you know, taking it off the wall and sort of encountering people in a casual, unexpected way. It, in a way, it's aggressive in the best harmless way. It's sort of putting your out right there um, and so people see it. But, you know, you're, let's face it, clothing is loaded with art, pattern and everything. You know, it, uh, clothing makers would think oh, that. I think it was a so, you know, I think it's uh, valuable. Well, I, I really, you know, I really think that, you know, in my my opinion, like Keith Haring was was the most effective artist in terms of bridging, you know, the kind of esoteric fine art world with with, you know, street art and a casual viewer can see it and access it. So I, you know, I I just think that not formula, but that idea is I think is is powerful, and I think that. Uh, what I like about it too is that anybody can do it. And instead of it just being about me and my vision, what, what I'm really interested in is inspiring people to find their own voice. So if this, you know, I've, I've shown this to people and say, oh, I can do this. And I said, yeah, do it. You know, I think that if everybody walks around with their own vision on their clothing, that it, it would just, uh, create a kind of a, a different kind of dialogue as to what art can be in a social context. It's a, it's a form like, oh, that's, you can say that that's Mike, or you can say that that's Larry. You can see that in the clothes, you know? And like Omar's is very specific, you know, like you can say, oh, that's his creativity. And it creates this environment where creativity can be freely expressed without a kind of hierarchy. <laughs> this is great or this isn't great. So John, that's what I'm, I'm really saying that in our culture now, it's almost impossible to buy a piece of clothing that doesn't have some label for some manufacturer that means nothing to you at all. And so you're, I would say, reacting to that in the best way possible. It's quite hard to find something that doesn't have a stamp, a, a horse or somebody, you know, it's, it's branding, uh, it's branding some other company. I had a high school teacher once said to me when I had a shirt and I was like, uh, uh, Cat Stevens image and he almost made fun of me saying if you were in another country they would say to you what a, is, the, is that your parents why are you wearing that image on yourself and it stayed with me it was a very strong thought and we, we often buy into the cursed commercialism of our clothing um, and you're wanting to put the person yourself into your clothing and I think it makes a lot of sense I do want to throw out a quite a unique story about Keith Haring I have a friend, Mark, who's a filmmaker who was at SBA at the same time. I think it was 1978. And Keith Haring was in school. And it was a little of people. I, I don't know if Kenny Scharf was in the crowd. Um, but Keith Haring started to uh, paint his images in the bathroom at the School of Visual Arts. And the teachers sort of realized it's Keith Haring doing it. And they told them, you know, this is great. They told him, you got to stop doing that. And so Keith turns to my friend Mark and says, what do I got to do? Go out in the street and do it like Basquiat? So that's like part of the impetus for why Keith Haring goes in the street. It's not the only one, but that's like the little art history that's never in the books. But Barry, Barry, do you remember, um, like if you'd go into the subway and you'd see um, a blank, a big blank uh, spot where an ad should be, uh, Keith Haring would, would do his art there in the subways wow. uh, and uh, other, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, so that's sort of the SVA telling him not to do it in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> now I got to go do it here in the subway, of course. Very quickly, people started to rip off those things. Right. <laughs> you get a Banksy now and rip off the building. And, uh, you know, Keith Haring really did what you said, his crack is whack uh, uh, wall that used to be by the FDR drive in Harlem. 
He, he mm -hmm. developed his own imagery, and I see why you like him, Michael. I never thought of it before, but his sort of figures and yours, not the same in any way, but certainly I see the similarities. So you know, thanks for bringing him up. Uh, a quintessential artist, no question about it. Thank you, Michael. Barry, thank you for bringing up uh, Kenny Sharp because that's what uh, your stuff, your art sort of reminded me of. Michael, yes. Yes. Oh, cool. You know, there's another girl, woman, Swoon. Swoon did the similar thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. She came later. Yeah, came later. And she was doing these like homeless etchings of homeless men and people and she would put them in like in Soho she would find these like alleyways and she would post them in there and you would look you would think it was a person and you saw that it was her, her like very large lino cuts and and I knew I, I tell you you know I the first time I saw it I said this girl's gonna be a huge star <laughs> instantaneously because she connected you know it was beautiful work and it had this kind of public art aspect to it that just connected and uh, it was interesting because I just was talking, uh, was watching, uh, he's a famous art dealer, I can't remember the name. And he was saying that's what he saw too. He saw her things and he, he knew that she was going to be a big star. So rather, I want to thank, well, thank all the artists tonight. Thank you all for coming and for sort of sharing your thoughts. It, we definitely, we're a creative group together. We've influenced each other in the studio by what we say. We influence each other by positive reinforcing thoughts or offering new ideas. Um, this is sort of an art community at its best. I always say it, we're a little hive, we're a little tribe, and maybe we've developed a little family in a way. And it's, uh, it's this is our last talk of 2020. It's been a great 37 Mondays that we've put together. And Artist Talk on Art is you guys. You are the artist, you're talking on art. The ATOA presents a platform. Uh, you can always email me if you don't have, if you're not on our mailing list or anything, you can check our website if you'd like to make a contribution. We'll be back next Monday with a very interesting talk. Um, and they've all been interesting, all 37. This will be uh, focused on photography. Um, again, thank you to all the presenters. Uh, for everybody here, I want a quick thank you to Mitch Pilnick, our board member who's here and has been a regular as well. So thank you, everybody. Keep thank coming. you, and happy holidays. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy, happy New, New Year. Year. Happy, happy, New Year. Year. Barry, happy one thing. and healthy. Is the address the same next month? Um, yes, I may. I left the same address. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. I left it the same, the same as before. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Good, Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. Good night. Happy, Happy New Year. Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.